thank you very much. I changed the slightly the title, but uh, uh, I would like to thank the organizing, organizer for the invitation. It's really great, great pleasure to be in Kyoto every time. I've been here many times, but each time it's a marvelous, really marvelous place. <clears throat> so I will start with something quite elementary. about persistence homology or persistent modules. So this is something which was, well, depending on your taste, discovered or invented by two groups of people. The first was from a topological point of view, and it was made by Baranikov around 1994. And the second one is by people working in data analysis. Well, there first was a group of Italian, Frosini, Farti, Robbins, that was around 1999. And then there were a number of other people, like Edelbrunner, Carlson, Zamorodian, Greist, and a number of other people. And this was basically from 2003 on. So let me <coughs> start with <coughs> with the point of view of B, so of data analysis. And the problem is the following. So you have oops, you have a cloud of points. So you have corresponding to some data. Okay. And you want to say that this is a circle, for example. Well, so why? Is this a circle? Well, if you look at this, it's not a circle. I mean, it's just a set of points. So if you look at the topology of this, there's, there's no topology in here. So what you do is you look at the set V epsilon, which is the set of point x. So let's say we're in the, in the plane, but you can do that in any space, such that distance from x So V0 is less than epsilon, and so this is your set V0. Okay. And so this means that around each point, you replace it by a small ball, okay. and you look at this set V epsilon. Okay. And so for each epsilon, you get some topology, okay, as eps and this topology will change as epsilon move. So you could say, okay, I, to figure that this is a circle, I will pick the right epsilon somehow, and look at the H1, so the first homology of this set V epsilon, and I will find <coughs> that this H1 is equal to R, and then I can basically say that this has the topology of a circle in a, in, in a certain way. Okay? But this is not as, as simple as that, because um, first you have to pick the right epsilon, okay? So notice that well first if epsilon equals zero, of course you see nothing. So H1 of V0 is zero. Second, if epsilon is very large, well epsilon very large is like keeping everything fixed but shrinking this picture. 
So if epsilon becomes very large, it means that you, you're only going to see a ball, okay? So V epsilon is like a ball, okay? And so H1 of V epsilon is again zero. So you say, okay, zero is a bad number, infinity is also a bad number for your problem, but there's going to be a, something in between that is a good number. But that's even not so clear because if you, so let's take, for example, this region here, okay, and then enlarge it here, so I will get something like this locally. Now, if I make, well, they're not going to be balls, but I mean, not for the, not for the standard Euclidean metric anyway, but that's okay. I'm going to get something like this. Okay. And then you get, uh, and then you get something like this. Okay. And so here you get Well, you see that in this, so the, uh, the epsilon is the union of all these balls, okay? And you see that here you get something in H1, okay? And then maybe you're going also to get something in H1. So H1, for example, here, H1 of the epsilon will have dimension two, but you don't have the impression that you're having two circles here. I mean, you only have one circle, one circle. So what happens in this case, I mean, that is easy to understand, is that you have like some spurious H1. So there's some H1 that appears, but as you increase epsilon, this H1 will disappear quite quickly, okay? And so the idea is consider not only the V epsilon, but also the maps from the epsilon, so induced by inclusion, from the epsilon to epsilon prime for epsilon less than v epsilon prime, okay? So because you have this map here, this gives you a map from the homology of the epsilon to the homology of the epsilon prime. That's for all, any epsilon less than epsilon prime, okay? Now, what are you going to do with that? Okay. Well, just for notation's sake, let's set HKT to be just the k cohomology of the set VT. And now I'm going to do the following thing. Take some T equal T zero and take some class alpha in HK of VT zero. Okay. And what I want to consider, I mean, I'm going to first to say this heuristically and then give a meaning to that. I'm going to, I want to consider the first time when this class appears and the first time when this class disappears, if it ever disappears, okay? So of course I take this class to be non-zero, otherwise it doesn't make much sense. And then I will consider something which I call T minus of alpha. And T minus of alpha is the infimum of the set of T such that alpha belongs to the image of H, well it's HK. of VT. But such a class could appear, disappear, or reappear. Well, if it reappears, it's not really, it's not really the same class. So. <laughs> From this point of view. So I fix one here. I have this T minus of alpha. I take T plus of alpha to be the supremum of the set of T such that the image of alpha is non-zero uh, let's write it the other way around. Uh, 
alpha is non-zero in HK of VT. And here, of course, T is greater than T0. Okay. So I, when I have a class I can, in HK of VT0, I can always send it to HK of VT for T larger. And then at some point, it could disappear or not. So T plus of alpha belongs to T0 plus infinity included. Could be. If it never disappears, you just say that this is plus infinity. Okay. And now let's make a picture. So here I will represent H0, here I will represent H1. Well, you could represent higher H, but for the moment I was in the plane, so there's not much more. So, and this represents, sorry, this represents T. Okay. And I'm going to represent the intervals T minus alpha, T plus alpha. So at the beginning, of course, H0 is very big because you have all these points. Okay. And so you start, and at some point, you see when two connected components collapse with each other, then something disappears. Okay. So you have a certain number of, uh, well, maybe I can use this, certain number of intervals like this. I mean, you actually have lots of them. And then you certainly have a big one because when epsilon is very large, so each one of v, ep v epsilon is a ball, so the H0 is one dimensional. So you have one dimension that survives here and which goes to infinity like this. And here, well, at the beginning you have nothing. And then at some point, some class will appear, like here. Okay, so you will have a class that appears, then disappears. And here you have maybe another one that appears and then disappears. And then maybe you have one like this. Well, I don't know where it starts. It starts. Uh, let's make it start here. So Which extends for a long All of these correspond to small bubbles like that, for instance. So this one corresponds to small bubbles, yeah. okay? And then you decide what's your threshold somehow. I mean, but in practice, what you see is that you're going to see sort of very long, very long bars like this. So this is called the barcode. So you're going to see a number of very long bars like this, and you're going to see lots of short bars, okay? And now you can decide, you say, well, here I see H0, here I see something in H1, even though at some point it, it will disappear, but it's big enough so that I consider that I actually, I actually see a circle, okay? <clears throat> and this is of, uh, easily implemented on a computer, so if you use this, uh, our program, I mean our software, there's a TDA, something called TDA package. So TDA is for topological data analysis. And you give a cloud of points. There are several numerical methods to do it. And it will just draw you these bars. I mean, just takes. You can do that in high dimension. Uh, depends what you mean by high, high dimension. The, the, the ambient space. The ambient space could be of high dimension, yes. That's, that's not so, that's not, I mean, it's a little bit more complicated, but it's not, not more complicated. What's more complicated is what happens if, uh, well, it will come up later. I mean, instead of having one distance function, if you had several of them. I mean, if you have something with values in them. Okay. So let's now switch to the point of view of A. Okay. 
So instead of a function, what you have, well, I will take a compact manifold just to simplify things. I will take a function which is smooth on M with values in the real numbers. And I assume that the function is a Morse function. And I will also assume that all critical values are different. In fact, I should have assumed it also here, except that at 0, you all, always have that all critical values are the same. But except, except this one, okay, I assume that they're all distinct, so I somehow know which, which class appears and disappears. Okay? So the genericity assumption in, in this case and also in the other case will be that when the homology jumps, which happens at critical values, it will jump by one dimension. So each time there's only, I mean, one could say that there's only one class that either appears or disappears. Otherwise, it's, I mean, it's more complicated to just keep track of things. And, and in a way, it's not very relevant either. Okay. Um, so you should, think, you should think of f as the distance, except that now I'm in a compact manifold. Okay. And all critical values are different. And now, what do I do? Well, I look at the set f lambda, so the sublevel set. So it's the set of x in n such that f of x is less than uh, lambda. <coughs> and now what we know is, well, first is that the topology of f lambda only changes for lambda critical value. And the second point is that you can actually reconstruct the topology of the f lambda using, well, uh, the Tom Smale Witten complex. So what is this? So I'm going to draw a function, which is going just to be the height function. And my manifold will be a sphere. So you have. four critical values here. And so the critical points are here. And what I'm going to draw besides the critical points are the connecting trajectory of the gradient, which connects points of consecutive index, consecutive Morse index. So I just go from, so I have one trajectory, let's say. Uh, maybe I should also use this. At some point, I will figure out how easy it is to erase the red chalk. But uh, so I have one here, one here, and the other one. Of course, there are lots of trajectory from here to here, but I don't count them because I only sit between consecutive index. So this is index two, index two, index one, and index zero. Okay. So that's, so what I what I get. If I want to sort of summarize this picture, I get something here. Uh, I can get these three, three critical points, well, four critical points, sorry. And I get, okay. And now this is a, now I have a complex. Okay. So the complex is C star F. I just put one factor, I use just real coefficients. You could use any, <coughs> any coefficients in a field. One should be a little bit careful because the result you get could depend on the choice of the field. Okay, so it's, there's, there's a small 
uh, point of caution here. Uh, so it's the sum for uh, of Now, because I assume that, uh, did I actually? I assume that all critical points are, uh, yes, I did. So I assume all critical points are different. I can identify critical values and critical points, okay? So here I say the set of critical values, but I could say the set of critical points is the same, okay? And then I have this, the boundary map, and this is counting the number of what is this? What is the x? The x is just a way to note the the element x. Uh, I can I can write it. I don't know like this. So you you add one factor for each critical point. Yeah, that's only only. Thing. So this is the number of trajectories of minus gradient f connecting x to y. So this is the picture. Okay, in this case, I have the picture here. So I have, so on this picture here, I have C0 is R, C1 is R, C2 is R2, okay, and I have the map here, and the map here, and if you compute the homology, you get the homology of the sphere. You get a little bit better than that because this is filtered by the value of f, so you can look at only those such that fx is less than lambda, so you can look at c lambda of f, which is the sum of the R X such that F X is less than lambda and the F X equals zero. The boundary map remains the same, means just in U. So it's, for example, if I look below this level here, I just cut this, okay? So I remove this point and then I have a complex which is left. And then a theorem which has been different version, but go from going from Tom to Witten say the following that the homology <coughs> of F lambda is the same as the homology of C lambda of F and the bound. Okay. So you can compute, I mean usually you say you can compute the homology of M, but if you think about it, you can compute the homology of all the sublevels and you get. So what does <coughs> what did Baranikov add to this? Well he added the following thing is that this complex can be quite complicated. I mean, here I made a represented a simple case, but you could have lots of points and you could have lots of arrows going in all directions, okay? So, uh, maybe I don't want to write this as a definition because it's, uh, I just want to write what a simple complex is. So simple complex is a complex such that you have a basis of generators such that the boundary map sends either a generator to another generator and in an objective way or it sends a generator to zero. So simple complex if delta is a bijection well, not a bijection. Uh, how do I say that? Let's say realizes 
a pairing between a subset of the set of generators. When I make a picture, it will be and vanishes on the rest. So simple complex is something like this. And then you have other ones which are just not matched. Okay. So you have a matching like this. Okay. And so the theorem which is due to Baranikov in 1994 tells you that we can replace the delta, uh, maybe I should call this delta m as for the most complex. We can replace delta M by delta B so that uh, C star F D B is a simple complex and again the homology of F lambda is the same as the homology of C lambda f and db now instead of tf. <coughs> so on what what does it do on, on the complex that's on the left hand side for example so if you have I have this complex here with this uh, Then I have another one here. And this will become, so here, just this one. And you can check that if you look at the restriction of the complex below any level, the homology you get in the end is the same. Okay. And the proof of this is actually extremely simple because it's basically uh, Gauss uh, uh, change of uh, linear change of variable. Okay? In fact, one of the problems with this theorem is that the proof is too simple, and then you don't really understand what's going on. Okay? But I, I'll explain a little bit more about that in a second. Okay? So what's the connection with the barcodes? Okay. Well, here I get some bars. I mean, this... This delta B just takes, makes pairs of critical, pair, pairs critical values together. And so when they're paired together, you just make a straight line between them. I mean, as, on the, as you naturally do on the picture, I mean, the question whether you put an arrow or don't put an arrow doesn't really matter. And <clears throat> then you get straight line. So there's just one thing that you have to modify in order to get the barcode is that these guys who remain single, you just add a straight line going to infinity. Okay. Because these are homology classes which sort of survive, okay. which are never killed. Okay. And so in the barcode picture, they will get something that goes to infinity. Okay. So if you look at So if I look at a function distance, okay, the Baranikov complex would just be the one obtained by replacing this by just arrows, okay, and eliminating the infinite ones. Okay, if I look at the Baranikov complex, and vice versa, if I have uh, if I have the if I have the Baranikov complex, okay, I just replace the arrows by bars, okay, and then for all those who remain single, I add a line to infinity. I mean, that's that's the only. 
the only change. And then So uh, one point which is which was clear in the in the topological data analysis point of view, and which is not completely clear in this uh, in this approach, especially when you look at the proof, is that these uh, arrows that you presented are exactly the arrows connecting so uh, classes that appear and disappear. So what exactly what happens? between these two classes connected by the, this red line is that as the level goes up, then you're creating a homology class here. So if you look at the sublevels, of course, here you have a homology class. Then here you get a second one, which appears. And then as you get here, it, of course, disappears because it's, you just killed it by, by, the, by, by this boundary map. Okay? And so you can recover. Actually, you can also prove this theorem in a slightly more complicated way but which I think is more useful, <coughs> is to exactly look at the classes that appear and disappear, okay, and say that they're connected by, <coughs> and you connect them by this uh, DB that you, you construct in this way, okay, and then this will give you the, uh, the Baranikov complex again. Okay, so this, these are just two aspects of, of the same thing. Yes? This complex is unique with other uh, the complex, well, it depends what you mean by unique. So if you change the field, you, it no, can. Just of the numbers. Sorry? Just the uh, well, once the field is fixed, the, comp the complex is unique, yes. For example, if you have some new data points, it's Q something like A plus B. And A, A born earlier than B. Then you, you, you have to decide which one you should find this one kills. No, what you assume is that all critical values are distinct and, and the only, so you don't have two critical values at the same. Uh, no, no, at, at some new point, I'm sorry. So yeah. So some new critical points. Yes. Choose some of the other two generators, for example. I don't say the identification is with the homology is unique somehow, but the complex itself is unique. I mean, you, I, I just draw, I mean, I just draw points corresponding to critical values, and I draw arrows, and there's a unique way to do that. Now, the way you, ident the, the way you identify this with the homology of, of F lambda is not unique. Let me get, let me get the Sorry, yeah. Okay, but, but the complex itself is, uh, is, is uniquely defined. Um, so one important feature is the C0 continuity. <coughs> so if F and G are two functions which are epsilon close, and if you look at the barcodes, <coughs> they are epsilon close. So I, want, I don't want to describe in detail what the distance is, but you see that if you have a number of bars, okay, <coughs> a barcode which is at epsilon distance is obtained by moving the endpoints by at most epsilon. Okay. But there's one other thing you can do, is that if you have a bar which has size less than epsilon, you can just kill it, and vice versa. If you have, if you have no bar, somehow you can make one appear, provided it has size less than epsilon. Okay. But so basically, the distance between barcodes means you can tweak the endpoints by epsilon. Just being careful of what happens when you, when you get close to the empty sets. Okay? And that's quite, uh, that's uh, sort of easy, because if f minus g c0 is less than epsilon, then you have that, uh, let me, 
you have f lambda minus epsilon, which is in g lambda, which is in f lambda plus epsilon. So if you have a class which is here and survives here, then you automatically get a class, non-zero class here. Okay, so the classes cannot be, <coughs> cannot move to, I mean, if one class was killed at some point, then the other must have been killed like at epsilon, either epsilon before or epsilon later, but not more than that. Okay, because you of course have the same inclusions by reversing f and g. Okay, and that's very, well, in a way, very useful because the, if you look at, um, uh, most function, okay, then the, there's, there's no, you cannot say much about in, in the C0 topology because the critical points can very well disappear or disappear in the C0 topology, okay, without any control. Okay. But what this says, but that, that was of, co of course clear, is that if by a C0 perturbation you're creating critical points, you're go actually going to create a pair of critical points that cancel each other and are close to each other, okay? And vice versa, if you kill the pair of points by a small perturbation, then it means that you kill points which were somehow in eliminating position and just disappear. Okay, but that's, that's a useful uh, thing. Okay, so now let me, you could say, okay, that's very elementary. Indeed it is. So what can you do with this? So application one, I said I would talk about PDE. PDE, this is joint work with uh, Le Petrec and Nier. <coughs> and so this is about studying the width and Laplacian on forms. So for this, uh, you have a compact manifold, again. You have a Morse function, again. And then you're going to deform the Laplacian. So first you deform, well, but that's sort of easy. So H is some small parameter. And you, so you conjugate D by exponential F over H. You take d star of fh, where star is the dual, is the Hodge star. Okay. And you look at the Laplacian, Laplacian fh, which is just the fh plus d star of fh. Okay. Now, what do you know about this? This was studied by a number of people, but in particular by Witten, in particular for forms. I mean, it was. And uh, so, what happens here uh, is the following. So, look at the eigenvalues. Well, first, maybe I should say that. This Laplacian FH sends P forms to P forms, okay? And if you look at the eigenvalues, which I will write as lambda J 
so just p to keep track of the degree, okay, uh, they have the following property is that you're going to have a spectral gap. So you have those which are uh, part of them, let's say, are in between 0 and h3 half. And part of them are outside. But in fact, it's more than that, because those which are inside here decay exponentially. So they are actually <coughs> behave like something exponential minus c of e over h. Okay. <coughs> So this was studied also by a number of people, in particular by Elfer Chestran. Okay. And so what you, what you know is the following is that, so I'm only looking at the small ones. Okay. And for Witten, this was a way to recover the most inequalities. I mean, I, Maybe not going to say a lot of, uh, about that. You will, you will certainly see that it's connected with this kind of problem. But one of the things that they prove is that uh, this lambda j p is uh, asymptotically, well, there's some term in H. And then it's exponential minus f of y minus f of x divided by h. So this is a term where you have h at some power. Okay, let's let's forget about it for the moment. But the exponential term okay, is such that so y and x are critical points. And what you know is that the uh, decay of these eigenvalues, which are in the interesting part, in fact, they are of two types. They are the ones which are exactly corresponding to zero, so they are harmonic. But because you've been conjugating this dfh and df star h, actually, these are, these are going to be the same as in the case f equals, uh, f equals zero. So they, are ju they just correspond to harmonic forms. Okay, and the number of them is just given by the Betty number of the of the manifold. Okay, and then you have those which actually move with with h, and this one behave like this. Okay, so this was this was known, I would say by um, yes by Elfer Chostran. Okay, but here you see that you you don't have actually so many. <coughs> of this, of this uh, eigenvalues, so the number of these eigenvalues is essentially the same as the number of critical points, okay? But here, you don't know which y and which x you have to choose, okay? Because y has to be a critical point, x is another critical point, but you have a lot of them, okay? Many more than the number of eigenvalues. So, so the question was, What are the x and y? So for p equals zero, this Laplacian is just Laplacian minus grad f. Yes. Grad there, yeah, there's a, there's, a, there, there's a formula. Yeah. And I think in that case, this was, uh, in case zero, I think it was studied. Maybe it's already in Friedling and uh, Wenzel. OK, the case, the case of p equals zero. Uh, so question, what are the x and y? And the answer is the following theorem. Uh, well, let's let me state this shortly. So the Fy minus Fx are the length
of the bars. in the barcode of F. Okay. So that's so, for all P. That's for all P. That doesn't depend on P, this thing, the length of the barcode. Uh, no, it does, because you have the, the uh, you have those which correspond to critically to, to, to the index P. OK? Because, uh, you, so, so I could be more precise. Yes, so for P goes zero, this corresponds to local minima. Yes. So of index, of index P. Okay. So it depends if you want, yeah. Okay, let's. And there's an interesting consequence of that is that if you sort of take the log here and rescale in the proper way, so this pj of h will disappear, okay? And you can recover, so you're going to recover this fy minus f of x, okay? And this quantity depends continuously, so continuously in the C0 topology on the function f. But it's quite obvious that if you change f in the C0 topology, the change in the operator is a total mess. I mean, you, you just don't see anything. But the asymptotic formula, I mean, the, the exponent here, somehow, will just change in a, in a very controlled way. So just to understand, so let's say x would be an index p, or yes. index 0, if you yes. know, but y would not be. Y would no, be y is in x p plus 1. Right? Yes, is the, the one, so, OK? So the usual context would be 1 would be the open minimum, and this would be the, the smallest. That sort of potential barrier. Uh, it's not clear that it's the smallest. I mean, it's like uh, uh, when I erase the picture here. I okay, it's one. but it, it's it's one of so here it would be here it's it's quite simple. So you have this this small uh, this small bar here, okay, and then the other two are infinite. So the infinite one corresponds to the eigen, to to the eigenvalue zero, okay, which I mean makes sense because it's like putting infinity here and then you get zero, okay. And the other one, but the other ones are not necessarily the shortest one. I mean, the, the, it's really a topological interaction between them. Okay, so it can be <coughs> can be more complicated than, than that. Okay, and uh, uh, okay, so that's one application which which is interesting and. Uh, I must really say that people ha had no idea of what this could be, okay? Uh, before you bring in this, uh, uh, this barcode or uh, Baranikov complex, I mean, th there was really no, no, no intuition. I mean, uh, rather something like you said that it's going to be the shortest, uh, like the shortest bar, which is not. So maybe for index zero, it's actually the shortest one. But in in uh, in higher degree, it's certainly not the shortest one. And uh, but but there's a natural pairing which which gives you this value. So that that's one one application. So let me give a completely different application uh, in area preserving dynamics. So this is joint work with Frédéric Leroux and Soban Sefadini. And the problem is the, is the following. So there's, for a group G, there's something which is called the Ro Rochlin property. And this exactly means that you have a dense orbit by conjugation, so that there exists some G0 in the group such that this is dense. Okay. There are lots of groups who have this property, and some groups who don't. 
And an example of a geometric group having this property is the group of uh, homeomorphism of the disk, which are the identity on the boundary. And let me shortly explain why. So this is plotting. Let me explain why. Well, let's take phi n be a dense sequence in the homeomorphism of the disk mod the boundary. So now I'm taking the unit disk, and I'm taking smaller and smaller balls, and I'm plugging phi n in one of these balls. Okay, so here, for example, I take a small ball, I plug phi 1. So plugging phi 1 means I conjugate the unit disk with this phi 1. Okay, and then, so I, I just take theta phi, phi 1, theta minus 1, and I plug it here. And then I'm going to plug phi 2 here, and then I'm plugging phi 3 here. Okay, they're getting smaller and smaller, but who cares? Okay, and so on. And then you can see that uh, if you apply something which is close to the opposite homeomorphism that conjugated phi 1, for example, okay, so if you, by deconjugating phi 1, so you can bring back phi 1 to be almost the whole disk, but not exactly. So you can bring this by conjugation to be something like this. So here you will have phi 1. And here in very small disk, you have phi 2 now, you have phi 3 here, and you have phi 4, and so on. Okay, so you just bring back this disk almost to the original shape, but of course you, <coughs> you need to leave a minimal amount of room for the others, but you can just leave them as little room as possible. And so you see that here, you move by, a, each point gets moved by at most epsilon, which is the size of this, of this ball, so it moves very little in the C0 topology, and here you're almost phi 1. So you can actually get as close to phi 1 as you want. And I can do the same with phi 2, phi 3, and phi n. Okay. So if I take the closure of the orbit by conjugation of this, so let's call this capital phi, then this contains phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, and because this itself is dense, it means I, I contain everything. Okay. And so there was a question by Begin, Crovisier, and Leroux, which asked, can you do this? Well, of course, you cannot do this in an area-preserving way, because you see that It's not can one do this, because you, as, as I said, you cannot do this, but. Uh, let's say for a surface, for example, but. Let's say omega some Lebesgue measure. Okay. Uh, so is this rocket? And it was proved by Sefadini some years ago that it's not Rochlin. Actually, he proved it for S2. And I, uh, in fact, for other surfaces, it followed, but for different reason, uh, by work of uh, Gambodogis, and uh, so that for higher genus and for genus one, Gambodogis plus work by Antov Polterovich. Okay, I'm not not going to go into this. So now, what you would like is to have some more precise information, 
And so the more precise information is the following. So I, I will write O of F to be the closure of the conjugate of F. Okay. And now I will say that F is equivalent to G if there is a sequence. So F0 is F, F1, and so Fn is G, such that OFI and OFI plus 1 intersect. In fact, it's the smallest equivalence relation. I mean, you could, you could have the impression that this is too complicated. You could just say that OF and OJ intersect. OK, but if you want to have something which is transitive, so if you want an equivalence relation, you have to add these chains. OK? And uh, so this theorem tells you that there's not, there's more than one class. OK, if there was one class, the, uh, the group would be Rocklin. OK, so the, And the question is, how many classes and how to distinguish them? So what I'm going to say is not exactly correct, because you have to, in fact, look at the slightly, well, potentially smaller subgroup than Well, no, I, I, I will. So now I have to introduce one last thing. So if F has isolated an isolated fix, fixed point X, X0. L of f x zero, so this is the left sheds. I'm sorry, what is the group? <laughs> the group I'm looking at is this is is going to be the closure of the Hamiltonian uh, maps of sigma in in the uh, in the group of homeomorphism. But now I'm I'm just going to state something for smooth maps, but. If S has an isolated fixed point, L of F X zero is just the left, left shed's index, sorry, of F at X zero, which means you have a fixed point here. Okay, you look at a small sphere S X zero epsilon, and you look at the image by the map F X minus X zero over fx divided by the room. So you get a map of surfaces from the circle to the circle, and you look at the degree. So L, so let's call this f phi x0. So L f x0 is just the degree of phi x0. And now the theorem, I mean, I'm not going to give the full generality. Uh, Says the following: So if F G are Hamiltonian diffeomorphism of sigma, and if F is equivalent to G, then the sum of the absolute value, so for all fixed points, are the same. And here I should say with isolated fixed points. Okay. 
well, it's not clear how this follows from this barcode thing, but somehow these numbers correspond to uh, the number of, uh, of bars that you have in a certain, in certain region. And I think this is interesting because it shows first that you have lots of uh, different classes because this sum can just be basically anything. And it also shows that these classes are extremely unstable in the following sense is that you see the important thing is that you're taking the absolute values. So in fact, gener generically, this is just the number of fixed points because L of f x is generically either plus one or minus one. Okay, so this just counts the number of fixed points. So if two maps are generic and have, a, have different numbers of fixed points, then they cannot be equivalent in this sense. Okay. But in a way, it's, it's worse than that because you can have a, a fixed point of index zero, which is completely degenerate, and which separates in two points of index plus one and minus one. Okay. But this contributes two to the sum and this contributes zero. Okay. So you get that by extremely small perturbation, you're ending up in, completely different uh, in a completely different equivalence class. And, uh, okay, there are extensions of this theorem to higher dimension, but I think uh, my time evolves over, so sorry for being over time. I'll stop here. <laughs>